Welcome back to the Locked In with Ian Bick podcast. A year ago, I never in a million years would ever have expected that I'd be introducing this guest right now to come on my podcast, but here we are. We have Chevy Chase on the show today. Yes, the famous actor Chevy Chase from the hit movies you all loved and enjoyed growing up, National Lampoon's Vacations, Fletch, you name it, he was on it. And he's here to share his incredible story of childhood trauma, his battles with addiction, and hearing some of the behind the scenes that we all want to know about during his incredible acting career. A huge thanks to Chevy for coming on the show to make this happen. We're also going to be giving away signed memorabilia that he has graciously given us to give away to our viewers today. If you guys are listening to this episode and want a chance to win, make sure you guys leave a comment on YouTube saying you're here for the giveaway and leave a good review of the show. And then also, if you're listening this on our audio streaming platforms like Apple Podcast and Spotify or wherever you get your podcast from, just leave us a review. My team and I will be actively looking at those comments and we will be reaching out to you guys directly shoot us an email at contact at ianbick.com once you leave that review or comment so we know who to get in touch with when it's time to choose a winner and send out that memorabilia. Lastly, I want to thank Lost Trail Communications for sponsoring today's episode. They provide affordable marketing and public relations services to small businesses, startups, and creators. You can book a free consultation at losttrailcommunications.com and mention Locked In to receive 25% off the service of your choice. Thank you to Lost Trail for coming on to sponsor today's episode, and I hope you guys sit back, relax, and enjoy my interview with Chevy Chase. Okay, you good? Oh, yeah. Wait, 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 let me get a sip of water. I'm with you on that. All right. Chevy Chase, welcome to Locked In. I'm not sure I'm going to be able to do this whole entire interview without laughing because you've had me dying for the last, what, 10 minutes since you walked into the building. Uh, thank you so much for coming. Thank you to Patrick and Nino for introducing us. Uh, what was it? Exactly a week ago, I was sitting at your home telling you my life story and I loved now it. here I am. <laughs> Who would have thought, right? Yeah, I know. And, you know, like growing up, we've been talking about Shapiro uh, forever now. <laughs> growing up, uh, I used to watch the the National Lampoon's Christmas Vacation. And, you know, as a child, I never would have thought I'd be sitting across from you years later. And last night I got to watch Fletch. Um, great movie. Really funny. And normally I'm not into like movies from that time period. And I loved it. So I'll be watching more of those. Thank you. I appreciate it. <laughs> awesome. So let's jump into it. Let's go. I'm ready. <laughs> Where are you from? What's your childhood like? And, and where'd you grow up? Awful. <laughs> there you are. Covers all of it. It was that bad. I don't know. I had a rough childhood. Uh, but uh, it was not, it was abusive somewhat, you know. Uh, but um, I'm from New York City. That's where I was born. I grew up mostly in New York City in Woodstock, New York. And... Uh, I'm 60. You're 60 now. <laughs> okay, I'm not. I'm almost 80. You're not almost 80. I'll be 80 in October. I thought you turned 61 this year. Seven. 67? 67. I got my research wrong. I apologize. <laughs> now, what did your parents do for work? Uh, let me think. Well, my dad was a great uh, publisher and editor. He was an editor of, uh, at New many play, great places in New York City, magazines, Commonweal, New Republic, et cetera. Uh, and, um, but he divorced my mom, I think, when I was around four or five. I hated it. I cried. When they got divorced. I had no idea. And uh, <laughs> you know, four. Uh, <clears throat> it was only later that I realized there was no low voice in my family. Uh, but then she remarried uh, a... Uh, psychoanalyst who was the head of psychoanalytic medicine at Columbia, Columbia Presbyterian. And he was an abusive man. He slapped me around and slapped her around. 
So this is odd, isn't it, for a psychoanalyst to, of such merit, as it were? So it was your stepfather that yes, was the abuse. Yes, stepfather, yeah. And what about your siblings? Were they being abused as well during this time? I abused them. You abused the siblings. Yeah, I, I figured I had to, really. Be. No, I had an older brother, a year and a half. He abused me till I was about 13. In other words, he, he bullied me here and there. Uh, and then he just stopped when I was 13. Um, we were going to the same school, not yet. Well, we both went to the Dalton School in New York and then Riverdale in Riverdale. Uh, for those of you who don't know, I don't really care. Anyway, um, yeah, Riverdale. Uh, I was, uh, let's see, kicked out of Riverdale uh, shortly thereafter, somewhere around uh, the end of my freshman year, and went to uh, another school up in Massachusetts, Stockbridge, Massachusetts, was the Stockbridge School. Uh, it no longer exists, but it was an incredible experience, beautiful countryside, um, good teachers and uh, a good uh, headmaster. And uh, I was uh, apart from all of the turmoil in my younger life at home. And so I began to be, you know, to grow up and be, you know, well, I became president of the school board, school, not the board, but, um, and I was also their star soccer player. So things happened for me uh, that I might not have expected. I went from there to Haverford College in Pennsylvania. I was there for a year. And uh, <clears throat> they told me to either see a psychiatrist or leave. <laughs> That's what they told you to do. Yeah, to see a psychiatrist if I wanted to come back. Mm -hmm. What did you say? Fuck you, man. Now, I don't remember what I said, but it was I was polite. I I uh, was used to this kind of thing. I was uh, kicked out of Riverdale, so obviously, uh, and that was summer school. I was kicked out of. <laughs> so that that's pretty difficult. I only had like a French teacher and my friend John Stone at the other side of the table. And we were both kicked out of that, even though we'd been kicked out from the school to go to the summer school. So, um, didn't learn much French, really. And um, yeah, I went to Haverford. And then uh, from there, I went to Bard College, which is a great school on a beautiful campus up in not far from where we are now. Uh, which is upstate New York, more or less. Uh, Bard would be about an hour from here, I think. You're probably familiar with it. or No, you didn't go to school. I never went to college. No. There you go. Yeah. I went to prison, not college. That's right. You were yeah. in prison. Yeah, I'm the, I'm the federal inmate. Why? Are, how come <laughs> I'm not doing the interview? Yeah, you should be interviewing well, me, right? Yeah, what was it like in there? <laughs> huh? Uh, <laughs> no, seriously. I don't want to know. It, you know, it was, uh, it's not what you expect. And I think that's why people are fascinating or fascinated with hearing stories like this, the craziness, uh, yeah. because it's a world that everyone knows of, but they don't know what it's like. All right. And I think that's why a it's lot a of- It's a party, huh? Yeah. It's, but it's the same reason why people are interested in you because you lived a life that everyone dreams of or, or knows of, and they never got to experience it. So, well, I don't ever want to experience prison. No, no, no. But I'm sure- it must have been awful. It was bad. Tell uh, me about it. Do you want <laughs> you want the highlight reel? Yeah. <laughs> well, a uh, let's see. A the funniest story would probably be a guard um, inappropriately touching me in the prison. Uh, oh, I was touched in the prison. You never went to prison. Uh, no, I mean in the prison. In the prison. Yeah. Uh -oh. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, next we're gonna have to do a part two um, <laughs> with you interviewing me. You know. <laughs> yeah, I know. So, did you ever get a chance to like face those? childhood traumatic experiences, those childhood demons at all at that age before, you know, you went off to start your career and do your own thing? Did you get to confront it? Oh, you mean um, 
my family, basically. You mean my mother and stepfather? Or? Yeah, and even your siblings have a conversation with them or just oh, let you I, face I've, it. Yeah. I th- I've, um, you know, m- when my mother remarried, she had three kids. So they're my, what do you call, step, uh, half brothers, half sisters and brothers and brother. And we do see my half brother every so often. He lives in Woodstock. And he shared with me that he had trouble too. But he was their actual kid. Uh, so uh, their father, his father, uh, was abusive basically to them too. So, uh, and, and he had trouble in school the way I did. And um, I don't think he ever finished really. Uh, I, don't, I think he may have finished high school. I don't think college. Um, not that it matters. He's a great, great kid. But I... Uh, I felt I feel for him because I went through the same kind of treatment. Did your mom ever realize what was going on? She was the abusive one, really. Your mother was. Yeah, she was. Uh, yeah. Why uh, would you say that? Because she slapped me a lot and uh, hit me, and because I would come home from school and be told to drop my pants and have her sl- hit me with a a stick on the backs of my thighs. Uh, it hurt, but I don't remember crying or anything, but it was ultimately the um, gym teacher at Riverdale who saw my legs in the locker room and wondered about the bruises across my thighs. And uh, somehow that translated into it not happening anymore. I don't know whether he spoke to who he spoke with or anything else. Also, you know, I was 14 by then, and uh, I, I don't, maybe I didn't give her a lot of reason to. I, yeah, I did. <laughs> I don't know. I was never a bad kid at all. I was very sweet, generous, funny. Um, I think that they were working out their own issues. Did you ever feel like ill will to your biological father for leaving you in that position? <clears throat> um, no. I loved him deeply. He lived, he always moved him and his daughter and uh, his daughters uh, and my stepmother, I guess, uh, uh, nearby. So that when we moved, let's say, to. Uh, just below um, uh, Spanish Harlem, you know, right in the 96 area. He moved uh, a uh, street away. So uh, he, he always met me and my brother as we would go up to the bus to wait for the bus for school. He would read to us. Uh, he was uh, a great father and loved to read to us. And he read the best stuff, you know, uh, uh, Robin Hood, books of that kind that were novelistic and uh, stories. And uh, he was great. And uh, uh, his whole life was tennis. He was a very fine tennis player. And I picked that up from him. How do you think people would have described you back then as a teenager in high school? I don't know. Uh, I would have to say, um, not the class clown. There was always somebody. Wally Shawn was the class clown in my uh, uh, Dalton days. Wally Wallace Shawn became an actor. A little guy. I am on fire. Remember that guy in uh, uh, was it Fletcher? One one of the sh- uh, European vacation or one of these things where. <laughs> Where we were gambling, oh Vegas vacation, mm-hmm. and uh, where I gambled as as Clark Griswold, and I would rush to his table, and it was this one of the great r- pieces of writing in the world was that that the dealer would be, I am on fire. Can you imagine? <laughs> in, in in fact, in a real casino. Yeah, that would have been wild. Beautiful. Anyway, uh, uh, yeah, I mean, just in the movie. Do you think that childhood trauma? led to your acting career because it pushed you away from your family to go out and do your own thing? I don't know. I, 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 it's a, that's a hard question to answer because um, 
I had never really considered it. I, I was, uh, I don't know how I, how I was uh, even. It's been so long. Uh, I've had so much self-confidence since, you know, college or whatever that all of those unself-confident years uh, have dissipated for me. I don't think about it much. I hate to think about it when I do because uh, I have dreams or wishes of uh, taking it out on my stepfather, that kind of thing, you know. Yeah. Do you think you use comedy as a tool to not think about that? I don't. I, I, that's a strange question. I don't know what the hell to use comedy. To, I just was funny, and I, I think my father was funny, and uh, I um, I just uh, liked being funny. Obviously, I liked being laughed at, so it may in some way lead into what you're asking, but um, it was a need of some kind because I would get kicked out of class and stuff for funny stuff. But I'd also get the teachers laughing, uh, you know. So uh, I rec recollect going into Miss Newby's class, Newby math class, and uh, coming, going to the bath, you know, Miss Newby, yeah, I have to urinate instead of, you know, I go to the bathroom. Yeah, that's fun. I have funny. to urinate. <laughs> yeah, I'm 13. You, know. <laughs> you have great recollection of all the names. Oh, yeah. I can't remember my teacher. I'm 28, and some of my teachers I can't remember. Well, you went to shit schools. <laughs> anyway. Um, sorry, no, that was a fair one. I set myself up for that one. I don't even know. <laughs> I'm just, but, um, no, I, I remember coming back from the uh, this particular occasion in the and opening the door, and the, the trash can is right there, and, and hitting it with my foot and knocking it over and picking stuff up for like a half an hour. I mean, a long time, just continuing to spill it and p pick it up. My daughter did this actually as a two year old <laughs> once. Uh, but, f you know, for me, it was just funny shit. I ended up doing that even on SNL at one point. Um, just good physical stuff. Were you always called Chevy growing up? Yes. How did you get that nickname? My my grandma on my dad's side named me that very close to when I was born because I was uh, – my, mother, my mother's stepfather was Cornelius Crane of the Crane Plumbing uh, Empire. <clears throat> he didn't leave her anything, frankly. It was this hideous thing in our lives because she took it out on us, but – um, when he died, but, um, uh, she named me Cornelius and my grandmother on my father's side, Woodstocker, said that's just a hideous name. I don't know whether she was thinking about Cornelius or, uh, you know, just the name being hideous, but <laughs> she named me Chevy. Does anyone call you Cornelius nowadays or no? Yeah, sometimes, but you don't no. Hurt. No. You know, I get, I get letters that say Cornelius Chase or Cornelius Crane Chase. Mm -hmm. Probably uh, not good letters when they're, they, they got no, the real name. No, they're just bills. <laughs> I don't know what they are. Yeah. Did you know what you wanted to be when you grew up, or did you have aspirations as a teenager? I just wanted to get it up. No, um, that's not a bad answer, actually, is it? It's for all of us. <laughs> uh, yeah. Well, no. I. It just it happened. fell into shape. Yeah, I... I, uh, as I told you, I enjoyed making people laugh. And I, uh, my father was so funny that I had a very high, um, uh, what's the word, uh, perimeter, you know, whatever, uh, uh, to go toward. And um, perimeter is not the right word. What's the word? High expectations. Expectation, yeah. We were discussing... Uh, the abuse uh, that I went through at, at my uh, uh, mother and stepfather's house. And I, I think he reminded me of a time when my brother and I were down in the kitchen across from each other, my brother about a year and a half over. <clears throat> and, uh, you know, I had been beaten up quite a bit, but not him. He was the firstborn and all that. Uh, not that I ever held it against him. I, I'm too young to care. But um, uh, this guy, uh, John Cedarquist, 
my stepfather came down, and uh, my marks were awful in school. I, and I understand why in retrospect, because I was, the work I was doing was just, can I live at home? You know, can I live through this shit? Uh, and, um, hey, and um, he came down and slapped me across the back of the head, get to the library like that, meaning go study. And for the first time, my brother stood up like that and looked at Cedar Chris, who was about six, two and 200 and some pounds. But my brother was a star quarterback at Rivdale and was a pretty tough kid. And I was big by that point, bigger than Ned. He stood up, I looked at him, I stood up, and we both looked at John Cedarquist, and he turned white and just beat it down this little hallway to his office where, as a psychoanalyst, he had patience, you know, and closed the door. So we scared him. Uh, and it started with my brother, and that was really the last time he ever touched me. So I think that's the story he was. That was a life-changing moment for you? Yeah, pretty much, yeah. And not long after you eventually left the house? No. Uh, eventually I went to Stockbridge, Massachusetts, so that, that school. But that would be a, 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 a good year later. Uh, so eventually, yes. Did it ever make you think about, or did you ever have to think twice about leaving your siblings at home with him? I didn't have siblings, really. I had half-siblings, and I didn't, uh, <clears throat> I wasn't close to them in the way you are to a brother. Um, that They were his kids, basically. And um, in retrospect, I mean, I, I've come to love them all, but uh, they're young, much younger than me. And um, I don't see much of the two girls. I, I do see John here and there in, in Woodstock, like I said, John Cedarquist, the son. So I, I wasn't in any way reticent about uh, leaving. In fact, I probably looked forward to it, but didn't know it. You know, once I was away, I, f I felt uh, much, much better. When did you realize that you actually had a talent? in comedy and that you were actually funny and you could turn it into a career. I never thought about that until maybe oh, after college, really. Um, with Ken Shapiro, wh whom you and I have spoken of, uh, we, we started underground television. Uh, Ken had the money and the cameras and the ability and very funny man. Uh, uh, to um, film stuff and video it and uh, actually bought a theater in the village, East Village, um, called Channel One, the Channel One Theater. And uh, well, that's where the concept of Groove Tube came out of uh, after s some years of, of work. Um, I think there was... There were others, the boob tube or something. And was, oh, the Safety Sam show was the name of one of them. Every year we'd have a new one, uh, every several months, whatever it was. And um, Safety Sam was a guy who uh, spoke about uh, safe sexual practices. But it was actually Lane uh, Saracen, a friend of Ken's and mine, upside down on a chair like this, naked, with, the, with a, just a, a camera on his genitals, but upside down, you know, a little eye on each ball. And, and we'd move the, the cock, and he'd talk, this is safety, Sam. Remember, kids, when you... It was funny because he'd start to get an erection a little bit, and we had to slow down. You know, we had to, okay, we won't do that much, you know, because this is massive cock of whatever it was. Right? And people were seeing the show live? Yeah. They were, no, not live. Okay, it was, they were, you guys were pre-recording it. Yeah. And then it would go out onto the TV, kind of like what we see now. No, it would be on tape. Okay. Two-inch tape. I'm serious <laughs> at that time. And I would be in the back of the Channel One Theater running the tape um, and living upstairs where we'd sometimes make 
uh, uh, videos. Um, so, uh, yeah, it was fairly simple, really. I mean, it, it required some money, but uh, people came and swarmed there. It was the time of the 60s of, uh, you know, everything new. You know, Janis Joplin, uh, that kind of thing, new. Um, so, and everything weird. And uh, we were very, we were the funniest. You couldn't get better, really. There wasn't anything funnier, not even uh, Monty Python. I mean, just, they, they were great and funny for themselves. And John Cleese is a friend I like. These guys were great, but different kind of thing. That, that was Great Britain. This was New York City. And this led to SNL, this opportunity that you were doing? No. Thank you for asking. <laughs> what? Had, there's no, no connection, really, at all. Well, you were spotted at these Channel One shows, no? A little bit, the but I wasn't on that much. He, he, Ken wouldn't allow it. Uh, I was a little too funny for him in some ways. This is not a great guy. I don't want to get into it. Are you in business? Are you thinking about starting a business? According to U.S. Bank, 78% of small businesses fail because they lack a well-developed business and marketing plan. Lost Trail Communications is a strategic marketing and PR firm that offers affordable marketing and public relations services to small businesses, startups, and creators. I'll give you six reasons why you should pick Lost Trail to help you reach your goals. Lost Trail Communications have worked with over 100 small businesses and creators across many industries. They are huge supporters of those re-entering society from the justice system like myself, and love working to help those in need change their lives. They have over 20 years experience specializing in creating marketing plans, go-to market strategies, social media management, and public relations support. They will take your startup, small business, or social media presence to a whole new level. They offer several different affordable payment options, including 0% down financing. Most importantly, these guys get the job done. You could schedule a free consultation by visiting LostTrailCommunications.com and mention Locked In when booking to receive 25% off any service you choose. Thank you again to Lost Trail Communications for sponsoring today's episode. What would be your message to someone that finds himself in a similar situation as you were as a kid and is too afraid to ask for help? I'd be the last guy to be able to give advice. Huh? I just feel that I've always felt to be kind to people, not to uh, push them around as a bully. I mean, look, I'm a big guy, so um, I'm well aware of that. And uh, somehow I grew up with that sense. I, uh, you know, run away, sure, why, why not? If you can take care of yourself, you know, and uh, obviously my, Sorry about this noise here. That was my feet against the hand. Sure. Come in. Come in. What the hell's that? Is that your phone? What a, is that my, that's my phone. Oh, sorry. <laughs> Wait, this is pretty funny. That's a great ringtone. It's the doorbell. Oh, someone's calling your house? Janie. I think you just answered it. I'm going to turn. Go. Yes. You answered Come in. Phone. Bye. <laughs> well, this is a first. I, I have to turn this off, don't I? Honestly. <laughs> I think you just mute it. Uh, turn, slide the power off. This is a, make a great blooper reel. It's pretty funny. Well, you know, there is a power in just speaking about it that other people find motivation in that. And they look up to you when people like yourself share their stories so openly, and that gives others strength. Well, um, I've shared it here, and this will play somewhere. So in that sense, maybe for people who admire me or whatever, they'll. I, I don't know that anybody can really take advice from an older guy like me about this stuff because you're so enwrapped in it. As a, as a child and as a, uh, a young teenager. Um, yeah, I've heard that, you know. Uh, oh, yeah, maybe I should, you know, it's just, 
you're under the gun all the time and uh, you're frightened. Maybe it's just looking at it as they see you and they know everything could possibly be okay. Absolutely. And they could end up being a movie star. I mean, that's where, that's where it sort of ends in, in that sense. How lucky can you get? Yeah. That I, I, you know, so I don't want anybody to be, uh, uh, <laughs> and I don't take my advice, please. I mean, there's nothing I can say for you, uh, people, uh, except try to get away and have somebody help take care of you and stuff, you know, because it meant a lot. <laughs> <laughs> it meant a lot. <laughs> but, you know, uh, I was watching a guy lot of Burps and he's dead. I was watching a uh, watching a lot of your interviews uh, about your humor. Yeah. And I realized like how funny you are and ex during that time period too and why everyone loved you. How does how did that lead to SNL? What where's like the start cuz I was listening to Well, that's where the interview started. Yeah. I think. Yeah. I was listening to something where it said, like, SNL, even after you left, after season one, yeah, that exploded into your acting career because you hadn't really done any movies before that. No. So what, what, why was it SNL that started all of that? Well, it was obviously no, a new thing, Saturday night, and live was not uh, expected much, uh, certainly for an hour and a half of these guys and girls. Um, uh, so, and it was very funny, you, you know, I, and I'll take credit in many ways for why that first year was funny. I think the weekend update thing, uh, helped give a sense of, uh, propriety in, uh, social and political spheres and, uh, that the uh, physical falling down and, uh, appearing to get hurt. Uh, had it took meant something. Uh, it's physical, and if you look at Chaplin and um, Keaton and Harold Lloyd and others of that ilk uh, early on, that's all they had. They didn't have uh, talkie uh, yet, uh, um, and they were brilliant. and And you laughed. People laughed at the sudden inconsistency of behavior and you know uh, I loved that and I was good at it so and I still am I'll get it that was spot on and you coined that iconic line which one the Saturday Night Live line that was you live from New York yeah yeah does it is it weird when you hear it if you even watch it today? I hate it. You hate that line? Well, here's the thing. I'm so attached to Lauren and Saturday Night Live. Um and so I I felt um oh it's not as good when I left. Of course it's as good. It's it is what people take and what they love and uh, they still come in droves to hear it and see it. Um, to me, um, uh, well, I've already talked about it. I, uh, uh, I, I, I was very attached. Just this weekend update was an impression I was doing of a newsman. Obviously not just me. It was, it was my impression of a news. Our top story tonight, you know, that's a news guy. And, uh, that's something we made up, Lauren and myself and other writers, uh, uh, Michael O'Donohue and Franken and Davis and others who, who were as high bell uh, writers and beats. So uh, the, all the sketches were made up of, by us. Um, so that uh, it just made sense that you do a sketch and, you know, you come in cold, uh, Cold opening, that's what it was cold called. Cold opening, yeah. Yeah, cold opening. And, uh, you know, you come in with a cold opening and people are watching TV and, oh, what's this? It's a, oh, that's a pretty funny sketch. Hey, people are laughing. And then you say, oh, that's because live from New York is Saturday night and it's live. And so you've told the story of that. And Lauren uh, felt strongly that that was the right thing to say and the way to say it. I, 
I don't remember whether I came up with it or he did or, or others did. I just don't remember, but it seems like it's mine somehow. When you see younger actors that are getting their big break on SNL right now, yeah, does it remind you of a younger you at all? Do you ever no. look at them? Not at all. I do look, but they're nothing like me. So it doesn't remind me of me. Um, I can say something about cheekiness, which I was, uh, you know, sort of cheeky. If that's, I don't even know what that means, but you know what I mean? Cheekiness. I mean, in other words, if you look at uh, updates and the smile I had on my face while doing it, that was sort of cheeky. Uh, I thought I was doing a, a newsman, but in fact, I was just laughing at the stuff I'd written, you know, that kind of shit. So um, I don't get the same feeling when I see younger people doing that, but that's because I'm not them, so... What was the first movie you got casted in after SNL? Jay? <laughs> she doesn't remember. What'd she say? What? Foul play. Foul play. Thank you, honey. She's so cute. You Go on now. <laughs> She's very cute. You got to keep her. I know. Yeah. <laughs> anyway. Um, yeah, foul play with Goldie Horn. Uh, yeah, that was my first movie. And that exploded your career after that? I don't know. I mean, it's a, there's sort of nothing that exploded it after that. Or I, I think it just sort of grew. Um, I mean, obviously, <clears throat> a lot of people saw that movie. And jo Goldie and I loved each other at that time. I mean, we were, you know, we sort of... A, a pair. Like you guys were together? Yeah. Really? I didn't realize that. Well, we didn't live together, but we, we dated, and, uh, and I, I find that a funny word, really, but uh, yeah, I, I thought she was great. I still think she's wonderful, and, and Janie does too. She's, uh, you know, she was uh, ahead of me, that's for sure, and so it only helped me to to be acting with Goldie. That must have been like the Hollywood fling of the decade at that point. I don't know. You don't think so? I don't think they had that kind of Hollywood fling of the decade thing back then. Now, of course, it's all over TMZ and those shows are. Yeah. Yeah. I was watching a clip. They said you were like one of the first actors to really be on a on a magazine, like out there on a magazine being promoted. Oh, you mean like people? Yeah. Yeah. Well, um, it's nice of them to say. I didn't think of it that way, but uh, being on the cover, I don't remember my sense of looking at the cover and, th uh, and thinking, look, I'm on the cover. I knew I was going to be on the cover, so uh, I don't remember how I felt. I obviously loved it. I mean, obviously it was a great thing, but by then I thought I was pretty hot myself, so <laughs> yeah, not, not worth a cover on people, but... Uh, of course, people say the, the deep thinkers. Is it what everyone expects it to be? What? When you reach that level of fame at, at that age? Was it? Did well, you I was enjoy already it? 20, uh, 38. What was I? I was old. I mean, uh, let me think. I wouldn't call it old. I think I was 30s, or young th 30s, around 33 or so, I'm just going to say. So it wasn't 20s. And I had gone through a hell of a spate since I was, you know, 19 or whatever. A long, you know, series of uh, funny events in my life that uh, led up to it. I, I can't remember really failing at anything at that point. Uh, only when I had my talk show that I fail, and uh, I don't care. It's a part of life. You got to roll with the yeah, punches. It's just the worst thing in the world that I wanted to do one, and in retrospect. But I, I wanted to do a talk show. And, uh, it stank. I know why too. Why? I wouldn't uh, take the. I wouldn't allow the writers to <laughs> write for me. I just. I was going to wing it. Okay. You can't. I mean, imagine David Letterman winging it. You just. You can't. Although I think he probably, after some period of time, uh, did because basically though he have a 
piece of paper like Jenny Leno or anybody else down there saying what questions to ask. Well, I didn't have that. I just had me winging it and it was just hideous. And Bob De Niro was my first guest. Do you ever regret not taking any of those late night show uh, no. positions? No. Because I'm sure they came around a lot. No. Never. They, they didn't offer you? No one's offered me shit. No, not now, back then. Oh, what do you mean, not now, you little shit? <laughs> I don't mean it in a bad way like Oh, yes, that. you do. No, I don't. I yes, mean you do. <laughs> <laughs> no, I meant it like at that period, you're exploding. I'm sure you're getting offers left and right. I don't remember. Maybe. But either way, you don't wish I you I think did those, movies right? was where I wanted to go, and I was just, I did one with Goldie, so. And then after that, that I did movies for quite a period of time. So movies was like the next step from TV fame. What was your favorite movie and your favorite role? Um, to Sir With Love. What? Um, <laughs> let me think. Uh, this isn't one of the worst movies ever made. Uh, <laughs> I got to Google that now. Oh, geez. Not a good watch you wouldn't no. recommend? And it's Sid, uh, Sidney Poitier, who's brilliant and everything, but... Still a terrible movie. Hideous. Uh, yeah, I don't think he was happy about it either. <laughs> I'm curious what, what was your, my favorite or yeah, least favorite? No, <coughs> your favorite. I'm curious what your answer is. About my favorite movie? And your favorite role. Oh, and my favorite. You mean the favorite movie of mine? Yeah, favorite yeah, movie I of yours. I can't tell you what my favorite movie was. No, favorite movie of yours that you played. Lawrence of Arabia was the my favorite movie. Okay. Just a brilliant movie. You want to put that out there? <laughs> Lawrence of Arabia. Um, my favorite movie, Fletch. Fletch was most like me because I pretty much winged it. I mean, it was uh, just right. I'm glad I saw that movie because I really got to understand you a little bit more by watching that. Well, it was it was very much me. And... Um, I don't remember doing much in that that I didn't make up at the time, you know. Um, I think it was Fletch where I sang, uh, Strangers in my pants, as I was walking toward the door to my apartment, just under my breath. Strangers in my pants. Uh, it's wonderful. Uh, that's Fletch doing that, but that's really Chevy doing that, you know. This idiotic Strangers <laughs> in my pants. <laughs> do you do you ever rewatch movies you've acted in, or is it weird to see? Well, I don't think it'd be weird. I just don't happen to do it. But uh, we have, you know, we can always get them uh, on, on uh, YouTube or whatever. I don't know how you get them, but uh, Janie knows to watch the movies. Yeah, I paid three. Yeah, bucks. Oh, I did yeah. watch. Uh, which one was it? Fletch uh, and Caddyshack uh, for charity. Yeah. Uh, why do you laugh, you big shit? Because somebody just came in and reminded me? Uh, Patrick and Janie, uh, who are now going to get married, uh, reminded me that uh, that um, the head of Campbell's Soup, Bob Campbell, anyway, uh, he had me in a hotel room, paid a lot of money to charity for me to watch Fletch with him. Did your kids grow up watching your movies and enjoying them too? No. Never? Uh, well, they didn't grow up. That's the first part. That's problem number one. <laughs> I think that reflects bad on you, no? No, we, I, we have three daughters. They're most incredible. And they're very funny. And I can't remember what movies they've seen of mine. Not that they give a shit, frankly. They love me and I'm funny at home and... Oh, that. I'm, I'm sure Janie will fly in in a second uh, on her wings telling me what movies, but she won't. she won't. What's that conversation like with your children when they realize that you're a, you know, a globally famous actor? It never comes up. But even when they were young, did they ever? No. That was just normal for them? Yeah. Interesting. But our, our well, what can I say? You know, I don't sit around there and go, get to the kitchen. I'm in foul play. You know, so, uh, yeah. No, it was never a thing. It was it was my work, and uh, so uh, they have no respect for me. <laughs> they love me a lot, though. 
Mm, that's great. Yeah. Now, with being a famous actor and during that time period, and you've been open about this in the news, there was a lot of drug use. Can you yeah. talk about that at all and what that was like for you? It was pretty much only Bruce Willis. You're blaming it all on Bruce Willis. Yeah, he's the guy. He was the drug dealer. He was a dealer. Well, he certainly dealt to me and the rest of the guys. No. <laughs> it's idiotic. Poor Bruce. <laughs> Hey, wait, Bruce has been through some stuff. I know. Yeah, you got to you got to leave Bruce yeah, out of it. Okay, erase that, please. No, but the dr the drug use during that time period, and you you come out in a lot of interviews to talk about that very openly. What was that like for you? That experience? Did it come with the job? Oh, I got high, man. It's all, great, it was all, great all the time. All the time, endless. Well, I, my memory of of anything, <laughs> my memory of <laughs> that's what it did. No, my memory of. Uh, of the um, uh, 60s and 70s was pot, basically. We were potheads. I, I was never really particularly stoned all the time. Uh, I, 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 got, I took acid once, literally, and uh, it didn't strike a note with me. I, I didn't really care, although my, my memory of it was, look at that rose. You know, it was literally that. But that was the first thing I saw was this huge rose, which is this big, you know. Uh, <clears throat> but um, it wasn't good enough for me. And everybody else took acid, uh, like uh, um, Ken Shapiro. Took, oh, hundreds of acid trips. Uh, my first wife took a lot. These were those days, uh, and... Uh, I can't remember how it affected them or didn't affect them or it just didn't uh, affect me that much. So you think it was kind of pressed on to you because of the sure. industry? Oh, I don't know about the industry. Which industry? You mean film? Yeah, film, Hollywood. You know, you're a big time actor. No, I don't think that had anything to do with it. No. Uh, I was a New Yorker, New York City, and and so these things came about from having a you know. Uh, a little career in the village, you know. Uh, it was all around our country, but I didn't know much about that or how many or whatever. Um, and obviously changed the world. I mean, I, first thing I can think of is the Beatles uh, with their acid trips and their pot. They were the most brilliant, and still to this day, brilliant musicians and people and uh, uh, I still have two friends that were in the Beatles uh, who um, don't show any effects of that really except of course for Ringo but no, I'm thinking that I take it back <laughs> <laughs> have you lost friends along the way because of their drug use because of me not because of well oh yeah I have of course. And did that ever make you consider and think about your drug use during those times? I didn't think of it that way. I thought, God damn it. I knew John was going, this was going to happen to him. And uh, we all did. Everybody knew that somehow he would end up killing himself uh, because of the amount of drugs he took. So, Do you ever think it could have happened to you? No. I, I didn't because I, I was too frightened of uh, things like acid or cocaine or Listen, I loved Coke, but uh, it didn't last that long. Uh, and uh, um, thank God for Janie, because uh, uh, she caught me once and uh, uh, whipped the shit out of me in a nice way. Got you on the right track? I think so. What do you think about all the uh, young kids nowadays that find themselves you know, battling drug use and battling addiction and, and succumb to that. It seems normal to me that people do. Uh, the ones who succumb, I, I'm not that familiar with who that was. Is, is that, was that uh, Purple? What's his name? Purple. Uh, yeah, Purple Rain. I don't think so. Who was that? Who's Purple Rain? Oh, Prince. Oh, Prince. Yeah. Uh, he Did he die of a drug overdose? I think so. Hello. Oh, nice to see you again. What do you mean? Well, I don't know. Didn't he? 
No, I'm I'm speaking more along the lines of there is a, a <coughs> rampant drug issue in the in the world, not just the United States. Yeah. And I think that, you know, a lot of no, people— Oh, you're saying it started with me? Absolutely not. <laughs> you got <laughs> what, out of it. What's the question then? No, just what your opinion is and what your kind of your message is. I think the kids is. today mm -hmm. ought to just drop that. <laughs> Forget it. Try drawing or, um, you know, taking photographs. <laughs> I don't know. Get a little coloring book. Listen, uh, this is where we come from. I mean, I, I don't know about you, but my, my generation, that's where it started. And um, a lot of people succumbed. Uh, a lot of people ruined their lives. Same thing can happen to anybody. Um, so be aware and be grown up about it. That's the best I can say to, to young people who don't care about what I say. Well, why would they care? I think they'll listen to you as someone that's used drugs before. Kids, you know, I was stoned to the bejesus my whole life. I mean, what do I say to them? I, you know, I knew when to quit, but I had a great support by Janie and, and just generally, uh, I was never much of a, a real drugger anyway. And you you don't drink. You don't do anything. You got completely clean. No, I drink as much as I can. Water. That's right. <laughs> or coffee. I coffee. mean, you, you got two thanks, water bottles. Thanks for right? reminding me. That was a great coffee by Patrick. Oh, I'm sorry. Well, don't ruin the mic. <laughs> okay. Well, uh, 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 no, I don't drink. I don't smoke. Mm. I wonder if I was like this the rest of the... Was the coffee bad? For the rest of it, no. It was fine. The rest of the interview? It was great. The coffee was great. You still got it. You still got it? Yeah, you still got it. This is... You got it? Yeah, that's, you got it. You're great. It's pretty sad. Hey, I've been laughing this whole time. It's a blast. Probably the most f fun interview I've done. Oh, thank you, man. I've interviewed like 65 people already. <laughs> I'm sorry, what? <laughs> <laughs> You have? Yeah, I That's have. That's a lot of people. Name the most famous. Hmm. Bruce Willis. No. I guess Chevy Chase, unfortunately. <sighs> I didn't want Did it to- Did you hear my wife? I, I didn't want Did it to be you. Did you hear her laughing? Listen, I didn't want it to be you. I was hoping for someone else, but I got stuck with you. I got to roll with it. Now, while Ooh, we're on no. this topic, yeah. I need you to say <laughs> something exactly the way you said it last week. What did I say? So when I met you and I got introduced to you and I was talking, you said something about like me being a scam artist or like a felon or an inmate. You said something really funny because I was telling you the story and then I said what happened about how I went to prison after. I and called you a felon. Yeah, I think that's what Probably. I mean. Yeah, but you got to say it in your voice. You're a felon. It was a little bit more energetic. You're a felon. That was great. That it was, was right not. Under I don't remember what <laughs> no. I said and how I said it. No, but, but it was funny to see your reaction because you never expected. It was probably something like, nice, nice to talk to a felon. You know, something <laughs> no. like, in that way. You were probably looking at Patrick. Why is this felon in my house right now? <laughs> okay. Yeah. What was a uh, a movie role that you wish you had gotten or that maybe you passed on and looked back on it now and wished you would have taken it? Let me think. I don't remember. Oh, <clears throat> what was the one with Tommy? Thanks. Forrest Gump. They offered you Forrest Gump, or you? They are did. Just, really? Mm -hmm. They offered you Forrest Gump. Yeah, the president and vice president. What do you mean they? No, like the industry. Yes, like I, I was offered. The, what, I've been offered lots of movies. Why did you turn that down? Did you not think it would become the movie it became? Oh, I thought it would with Tom Hanks, but not with me. I didn't. I didn't feel. Uh, acclimated. Look, uh, you don't want to open a movie with a six foot four guy sitting on a bench. And you know, I always felt it. it it's, it's not me. So, it, Tom was brilliant. And uh, I still think he's an excellent actor. Wow. What, what has happened to him, by the way? We haven't seen much of him. Tom Hanks. Who? Are you saying Tom Hanks? I am. Should we investigate it? Why don't we? We'll get him on the show. We'll do a double interview, okay. me and you. You could be the new co-host. 
Thank you. Yeah, locked in with Chevy and Ian. And Bob Goldthwaite. Yeah, and we'll have some Waters coffee. (laughs) Get one of those, like, foot massagers. It'll be good. Oh, my God. Wait, I still can't believe that you were offered that role. Not in a bad way. It just, that's something that we we watched in high school. They played it for us in, like, AP history class. And that's such an iconic movie. It was great. Um, But think about it. It's... And not Citizen Kane. It's not. Uh, it's iconic, in in for its time and, and for that period. Uh, even now, looking back on, but this is still part of that period. And uh, um, I don't put it up there with um, uh, Chaplin, Keaton, the, uh, to serve. No, not that one. Um, you know. The ones that we've I've spoken of, uh, uh, Lawrence of Arabia, <laughs> Citizen Kane, etc. I don't put it up there with, with that, but uh, it's it's uh, he was great in it. And it, did it get an Oscar? I, think I don't think so. I think he did though. Yeah. Yeah. What about all time ho- best Hollywood story? If you had to name one out of your entire career, maybe funniest moment or the craziest thing that's ever happened. Janie? <laughs> oh, man. Uh, well, I can't. No, that's okay. Funny <laughs> Hollywood story. Don't fall asleep on me. We only oh, got sorry. a couple what questions happened? left. Any mail for me? Any mail? You know, you opening up the wedding invitations are the funniest thing I've ever seen. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I love those clips. Oh, good. Those what? are great. Somebody should see those. Yeah, they're all on TikTok. <laughs> what? Why are you laughing at me? Because <laughs> we've done this. Three... Uh-oh, here's my wifey. Every day, Peter and Sydney and Milo send you things from TikTok and YouTube, and you love them. I let them? You love what they send, the oh, little yeah. videos. Oh, yeah, absolutely. So you do see it. You do participate. Come over here and sit on my cock, on uh, my lap. Come on, honey. A little kissy poo poo. Go away. Oh, my God. Oh. <laughs> do you I ever go on social media? Lover. Do you ever go on oh, Here we go again. <laughs> and what? Yes. Do you ever go on social media at all? Well, Janie will show me TikTok. And uh, yeah, my my friends. Uh, yeah, they, you're pretty active on social media, like posting wise. That's Patrick. He does that part. No. I don't do anything. But you're in it, <clears throat> and it's funny. And I think you know my generation watches those clips and loves them. <laughs> that is that right? You've seen me. I've seen you. Yeah, I think you're hilarious. It's pretty funny stuff. It I is have fun. to admit the chickens, the chicken voices. What? <laughs> Give us your best chicken impersonation. <laughs> How did you know about that? I watch your videos. I got to stay did, reversed. Oh, yeah, we did a video in the chicken place. You've done multiple place. videos in the chickens. I've done multiple? <laughs> <laughs> God. So We have chickens. So let's let the audience know that I have chickens. You don't just randomly make chicken uh, voices. Me, well, no, I do. <laughs> What's it like to get? We also have horses and dogs and can I, cats. Can I ride on the horses one time? <laughs> Is that a horse? That's not a horse. Oh. <laughs> Wilbur. That's not bad. What's it like to get recognized out in public when people come up to you? By horses? By the chickens. They love me. <laughs> By people? By people. It's very rare that they it, recognize It's not me. rare. Well, we don't go anywhere, so that's rare for me. <laughs> well, when Patrick drags you somewhere, you know. Well, he doesn't drag me much, but he dragged me here. Unfortunately. <laughs> I know. For that. me or you? <laughs> it's not a bad spot, though. And we got you grapes. I've had fun. So far. I'm not finished. Okay. So you still got a little bit of energy in the tank? I have some. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> That camera didn't get that angle, don't worry. Oh, I, uh, Remember, we're I only shooting your good parts. But yeah, go ahead. So you have this incredible career. <clears throat> you know, you're you're an icon in, in a way. What's life like for you now? Iconic. 
life's iconic now? <laughs> Playing with your chickens is iconic? I play with a lot of things. Um, Jesus, man, I, I think I've told you. I, I How can I express it any better? I love my life. And it consists of my daughters and my wife and um, friends, you know, not Pat, but, you know, friends. What's an average day like for you now? Oh, well, I wake up around 11, 10. This morning I woke up at 9, which is uh, kind of unusual. I usually wake up and Janie's already up. I go to bed, Janie's already uh, still up. <laughs> uh, my life is about Janie all these many years. And because, um, you know, we're the only two people who only see each other. <laughs> anyway, uh, no, she has many, many, many friends. That fuck, I'll kill him. Oh, I'm sorry. Anyway, she has many friends. But, you know, I, uh, I don't know, man. I, I don't think it's any different than most people's lives, even though they're family. I think, I'm, maybe I'm guessing, at a certain age, obviously, you're just pushing to get ahead and, uh, and uh, I'm not. I haven't for a long time. I am ahead. Do you ever wish you had, you know, lived a normal life at all? Like not having the acting career, maybe gone no. a regular, never? Never. I've always loved my life. And um I'd be sad uh, I, in retrospect, I guess. I don't know. I, I uh, would be needier. Uh, I'd be uh, more frightened. I'd be more, you know, accustomed to behavior in my childhood or wh whatever it is. Uh, um, so everything I've done is me doing it um, with help, obviously, from agents and people and friends and wifey and daughters. But um, pretty much I've been the decider in my life, and I've been very lucky. Uh, I, th I guess the more transparent answer, well, the most, I guess the more, the better question is, what do you think of yourself? No, I, um, <laughs> is that what uh, you asked me? I, I think I think you you said you know you explain like your family and and giving that summary and how you value your life now. I think that says it all right there. Yeah, and by the way, I'm very well aware of what I've done or accomplished or have it, but um, I'm very satisfied with it. So I think it's so important to me in retrospect again, but I, that I have the closeness of my uh, marriage and, and family because I came from a situation that didn't uh, merit my uh, being you know, envious of it. Did you ever get to have closure with your mom or no. your stepfather? Never. Never. Does that ever keep you up at night thinking about that? I do, on occasion, think about uh, punching him in the nose, breaking his teeth and his nose. When you had kids, did you want to make sure that they never experienced what you experienced as a child? I spank him. <laughs> of course not. But they're do they're girls. I mean, as a, this happened more to boys, I think. At least it seemed that way to me that, uh, it, well, it should be. You can beat boys, but not girls. You know, that kind of look at it. But uh, anyway, uh, I don't know. What, I don't know. I think I've explained myself. To the best of your ability. Yeah. Now, if you could go back to your 18-year-old self, what advice would you give him? What would you say to him? To me? To myself? Yeah, if you were if you were standing in a room next well, to your 18-year-old Well, that's a stupid so. question, isn't it? I thought, was, think about it. <laughs> I thought it was a good question. Because it gives people insight that are 18 now and listening to this, and they need direction and they want to learn from someone that's lived through that life. So if you had to go back and do anything maybe different or a good piece of advice. Oh. I know it's the hard ones that always suck. Well, 
I don't know what to say. Uh, if you want to be like me, uh, well, if you if you look up to me, if you think that I know things, I do. But I've learned them over a long life, um, and I think in that life. I've always been generous. I've always been um, funny um, due to others that I've been funny with or my dad or whatever. I've always been um, a well aware of people's weaknesses and uh, how to support them. In, in those situations as opposed to bully. I never bullied. And uh, the, the people I'd like to bully are the bullies. But I, I'm just not a bully. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, go ahead. No, I was, I, <clears throat> I was reading, you bring up bullies. I was reading an article where you said you were very, a, a big part of your career was speaking out against bullies. And those that were bullied as a as a child, what's kind of a message to someone that you would send to someone that's going through getting bullied in their life and it, and is going through maybe a situation that you've been through as a champion? Well, for those. you're going to grow up. Uh, you're going to be an adult, hopefully. Uh, by the time you're in your 20s, you'll probably be about as big as you're going to get unless you become a fat ass. And... Um, uh, you know, you'll have a lot more confidence in yourself. You'll be less um, open to being bullied. Just think in terms of the future. Uh, this will end. This part of your life will end and you will grow. And you'll be able to set things behind you even if you can't, even if they're still there and they hover or they're a part of some part of your brain, and uh, it's happened. It's over. Always think in those terms. And I think that's great advice for anyone that's going through anything in their lives, which are a lot of our listeners yeah. that t hear a lot of the stories because we have a lot of people on <clears throat> the show that have battled addiction, have went to prison, have had low moments, and— when individuals are talking about those low moments, others that are going through low moments in their lives get inspired by hearing these people that have overcome it. Mm. So there is a power in that, and, and there's a power of over, overcoming and, and motivating others in the process. Yeah, I think motivating, I think overcoming uh, will happen naturally in, I hope, many cases. I don't think forgetting will happen. I'm not sure if forgiving will. It's not important, really. You, these people who have bullied you don't deserve some kind of forgiveness. Uh, I'm sure there are many mistreated young people who uh, were sworn to forgiveness by the parents for beating them <laughs> uh, so that they, uh, you know, do you forgive me? I forgive you. Do you forgive me? I forgive you. Uh, <clears throat> you better forgive me. I forgive you. You know, I don't know. I mean, I wouldn't. Uh, I wouldn't go much beyond that. Would you fix your cuff? It's been bothering me all night. This day, yay! Well, I don't have a crew watching me every second. I apologize. I'm sorry. I don't have that luxury like some people in the room. What? It's a guy behind you. Don't worry, Chevy. Thank you so much for coming on the show today. I really appreciate it. This is an opportunity of a lifetime for me. And, um, you know, I'm just a kid that started this podcast in January. And January? January. What the fuck am I doing here? That's a great question. You got to talk to your agent or whoever got you onto this podcast. Pat! Yeah, next time I would definitely let them know you don't want to do any new podcast, startup podcast. No, it's okay. You were very good. I, I appreciate your questions. That'll be 50 bucks. You know, we agreed on 200, but you just lowballed yourself. Oh, no. Sorry. Chevy, thanks again. Get home safe and, you know, look forward to keep watching your uh, ch chicken impersonations on TikTok. <laughs>